Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Science of Superpowers. So glad you could join us again. Very excited to be here. We have another fabulous episode for you as part of our Men of Co-Creation. We are celebrating that. The Superpower Network celebrates the men of co-creation, men who have dedicated their existence to the pursuit of something beyond themselves. In areas like science, business, medicine, personal development, religion, family, relationship, and many others, these men have stepped up and said yes to co-creating a world that aims to inspire all of us. Thank you for modeling admirable character and honorable pursuits. We love you, love each other. And today's guest truly is no exception, folks. I'm so excited to introduce you to him. So we're gonna jump in and do the, the superpower activation piece so you can hear from him yourself. I am Tonya Don Reckla, and I have superpowers. All right, it's your turn. And I'm Rabbi Rami and I have superpowers. Brilliant. I love it. All right. What are your superpowers and how are you using them for good? Well, I'll tell you, right, because I never thought of myself as having superpowers, but I was in Europe one time at a European Union conference and the conference wasn't going well. It was people from all over Europe, and they were supposed to be in dialogue, but there really was no dialogue happening. And at some point, a fellow from India leaned over to the convener of the conference, and he whispered, though I could hear it, uh, he whispered to her and said, turn this over to Rabbi Rami, he'll fix this. <laughs> and so she said, okay, we're going to, you know, Rabbi Rami's going to do something with us. And I was stunned. I didn't know. I had nothing in my head. I had no idea. What, <laughs> but I sort of just, I mean, what do you do? You can't, if you think about it, you're stymied. You're stuck because you're in your ego. That's and, right. Oh my, what am I going to do? Well, I can't do anything. I, I'm part of the problem when I do that. So I, I was blessed enough not to get into that mode. And I simply trusted reality, trusted the universe, trusted the field, trusted the mother, trusted whatever you want to call it. And I simply gathered everyone together uh, in, in it's like a huddle. There were a lot of us. It was a big huddle. And I asked everyone to find their heartbeat and to tap their heart to their own rhythm. And after just a couple of minutes, everyone was actually tapping in sync. And then I started a chant. Now, I, I do a lot of chanting in different languages. But one of my favorite chants is Om Namah Shivaya, a Hindu chant. So I started doing that in Sanskrit, and everyone slowly picked it up. It wasn't, it's not very difficult to do. And there was a Hindu guy there from India who was a, a well-known Indian uh, guitarist and swami. And he went, left the huddle, grabbed his guitar, came back, and he started playing the music for the chant and bringing the chant to a, a more aesthetic level than I was doing a cappella. And the whole group just started tapping their hearts and singing Om Namah Shivaya. And we did that for a little while. And the group became one heart, one voice, one chant. And then it just seemed to me time to stop. And we ended it and went back to our seats. And the room, the whole energy of the room had changed. We were now really in community, in communion, even more powerfully. Later on that morning, I asked the guy from India why he did that. And I said, why would you do that to me? And he said, don't you know that's your superpower? <laughs> create these rituals that will bring dis disparate pe groups of people together into a greater harmony. <laughs> so that's my superpower. And the way I use it is the way I used it in that case uh, to, to create to help people taste, experience the greater unity of which we are all a part. So beautiful. What a fabulous story and a great setup to today's conversation because we're going to be sharing the walk of the Lamed, Lamed Bavnik. Is that correct? Right, Lamed Bavnik. 
So when you dive into Rabbi Rami's world, you learn a lot, right? And he just he just encapsulated a lot of the essence of what you discover, which is he said so much in that. If you if you didn't catch all of the nuances and dimensionality and everything that he just got done saying about the very essence of his beingness and what he believes is possible for all of us, you missed it. Go back and review it because it was all in there and it sets it up really beautifully. When I got into your space and was really sitting in this conversation, this concept was new to me because I'm, I'm more reared in the messianic traditions and, and I hadn't heard the phrase before. And when I started diving into it, it was like, you know, those, those roots that just open up and you're like, Phoosh, right. And I loved the concept of really standing up. Well, this was my interpretation of it because the, the history is so rich for me. What it did was it reminded me of my walk with Christ and how that evolved over and over and over as like what my relationship was with him, what my relationship was with myself, what my relationship was to others. You know, I always giggled along the way of like, love God, love each other. And I'm like, oh, there were a lot of real like fine print points. And they're like, like they should have put the, the cautions before the spell. Right. And so you kind of you sit, you, you walk through those experiences and you develop these relationships with whatever you can wrap your mind around the essence of creation and the creator to be. And they, they serve as these beautiful bridges. And so here was this concept that at every given moment, there are 36, at least 36 people who are so incredibly lit up and locked in to that way of being that you just described, which was like, I can do nothing. I can do nothing. It's done through me. I agree to be here. I agree to light up. I agree to shine. I agree to love God and love others here. The idea that 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 that's happening all around, like it just it was this beautiful concept to me, and I'm sure I've morphed it and warped it into my own way of understanding. Can you share with us this concept and why it held such a personal kind of why why it bore mention within the this beautiful space that you created? Well, I think it did a great job with that. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know if there's much to add, but it comes from a teaching from a fourth century rabbi uh, named Abaye, and it's just a one-liner in the Talmud. The Talmud is an anthology of rabbinic teachings that spans uh, five centuries, and it, it it's just got 60-some-odd volumes. It's huge. And there's this one line where Abaye says, there are always at least 36, and there's a special meaning to the number, there's always at least 36 people, doesn't say Jews, doesn't say men, it just says 36 people, awake to Shekhinah, and I'll have to explain that in a second, but awake to Shekhinah, uh, and then living uh, the way we would say it is in, in Genesis Chapter 12, verse 3 says people are called to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Mm -hmm. When you're awake to Shekhinah, which is the divine energy, you, you live as a blessing to all the families of the earth. So he says there's always 36 people awake to Shekhinah. And that's, that's the line. It's just a throwaway line. So let's start with the number 36. So in Hebrew has a lot of numerology because in Hebrew there are no numbers. You know, like we have Roman numerable numerals and Arabic numerals. In Hebrew, you only have the Hebrew alphabet. So every letter of the alphabet does double duty as a letter and a number, which means every word in Hebrew has a numerical value. So the word for life, for example, chai, is made up of two letters, which if you add them together, comes up to the number 18. 36 is twice 18. These Lamed Vavniks, and that's the number 36, these 36ers live two lives. They live for <laughs> themselves, they take care of themselves, but they also take care of the life of the planet, the life of other human beings, the life of other beings in general. So they live not only for themselves, but for the greater well-being of, of, all, of all beings. So mm. that's why it's 36. But more importantly, in my mind, because he says it's never fewer than 36, so it could be any number, but more importantly is that they're awake to Shekhinah. So Shekhinah is usually translated into English as the divine presence, but it's because Hebrew is a gendered language. Shekhinah is a feminine gendered word. 
So the rabbis who were incredibly patriarchal and uh, created a, a masculine dominated society with themselves at the top. Sounds familiar. Yeah, right. <laughs> their, their experience of God, which you know, they called God Lord and they called God King and the pronoun was always he and his, but their experience of God was almost always feminine. So when they heard God's voice, the language that they put to it is they used the, the term bat kol, like bat mitzvah, the daughters, the, the a daughter of the commandments, bat mitzvah. Bat kol means they heard the voice of the daughter. So when they heard God speaking to them, they heard a, a, a woman's voice. When they experienced the presence of God, Shekhinah, they experienced the presence of the feminine. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means, because you don't want to put, uh, you know, Western gender stereotypes, what does it mean to experience the feminine? I mean, you don't, I don't want to read into there to what they meant. For me personally, because my experience of the divine is uh, the divine feminine, the divine mother, for me, it's this um all encompassing sense of unity this fierce love this fierce grace ramdas used to speak of the divine mother as fierce grace or the fierce grace of his guru he talked about but a, a fierce love that would burn away everything that was false leaving you only with the true but it was a love that was tough you know it wasn't like oh everything's okay i'll take care <laughs> of you it, it was more, um, come here, and I'm going to show you what's true. And it's going to hurt if you don't, if you're not surrendered to me. It might if sting for a minute. The, yeah, if, yeah, it's going to sting. <laughs> if you're clinging to the false, if you're clinging to the ego, if you're clinging to your tribe, it's going to burn. But if you let me burn that all the way, it's going to be bliss. Mm -hmm. So the the experience of God or, or being awake to Shekhinah is being awake to reality as it is when we're free from all of the conditioning of race and ethnicity and religion and sex and gender and you know all the stuff that divides us until we can actually experience the fact that you and I and everything else is God is the divine mm. happening. Mm. Um, so that's that's what these Lamed Vavniks, these 36ers, are experiencing. But but I want to take one going on a little longer than I intended, Tonya, but I wanted to just quibble with one thing where you made it sound like they made a choice. And <laughs> it's really choiceless. Right. That it's not like you can set out, I'm going to experience, I'm going to awaken to Shekhinah. And because that's ego. It's, it's not that you can do this by yourself or for yourself. You can simply strip away, and even then you need the help of the divine, but you can strip away what the Hindus call neti neti, or in Christianity, the apophatic, uh, the, the path of the negative, where you just say, you know, not this and not that and not that and not that, until you, you've taken away all the false. And what's left is what's true. And, but you keep, but the ego can't do it. It's done for you by the greater reality of whatever you want to call that greater reality. It's, it's a gift of grace. And once you've received the gift, and I think she gives it to everybody equally, it's just a matter of, are you open or you're not open? But if you stumble into it and you're open to it, it's not a matter of, oh, I chose this, or I'm doing this, and uh, too bad for you, you didn't. It's, <laughs> I've been, I've, it's luck, it's, it's grace. I'm just lucky enough to do this. Or I've been lucky enough to bump into someone who's awake, and they've mm -hmm. guided me into how to do this. But ultimately, it's not me. It's not my choice. It's not like, yeah, it's, it's just not ego-driven. It's something else. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but totally the, the way that I encapsulate it for myself is, is I made a choice. I made a choice to develop myself so I could stay awake and consciously aware so that that those moments present themselves to me. And when they present themselves to me, I'm prepared, right? Energetically speaking, yeah. I've 
I've gone through those processes that you talk about, right? The life review process, like, like, like not waiting till death to start that process, right? Because early on, it, it became really apparent that we can teach people sort of how to clean this stuff up. But ultimately, if we're continuing to replicate programs that started the mess in the beginning, we also have to be willing to change how we're being in every moment. So, so perhaps it's not applicable um, to the tradition of that story, what it reminded me of was the mom every single moment reminding yourself of the choice you made kind of thing. Like that to me is what inspires me to move through some moments when I'd rather let my conditioning take hold, but I know what that creates. Now that's being in some semblance of conscious choice. And I can see where um, the essence of it, the introduction of it, the presentation of it um, at least in the, you know, how our clients and how, how my experience was, was it was optional and it wasn't optional. Right. And it's not, I can't speak to that experience, but the lighting up, right. Like we see the threads everywhere. Um, you know, being the one, I like to remind people like, just because they're, you know, somebody accepts responsibilities being the one doesn't exempt you from also being the one right there. We're all the one, like you said, it's, it's available to everybody. There we're going to dive into this after the break because this is really juicy. So Rami, we have lots to talk about. We're going to take a pause here because it just dawned on me that that we're going to we're going to move this into the second portion of the interview. So right now, where can people go to find out more about you? Uh probably the best place to go is my website rabbirami.com. Beautiful, beautiful. And go over to Superpower Experts folks if you want to learn how to how to kind of walk with this, right? Well, the, the master your personal power stuff, the starting out of like, how do I even explore this for myself, right? This wealth of information that Rami's bringing forward here, like it's held up, it is, it is available in terms of what you do in every moment. And seeing that I think is incredibly powerful. So you can check that out at superpowerexperts.com. I cannot impress upon you enough the work that Rami's got going on over at in 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 terms of the depth of the religious material, the depth of the history, I mean, you feel it, right? It's like, I just want to keep listening to you. Like, tell me more and tell me more because the way you've synthesized the traditions and are able to bring them together and mirroring them, um, that creates that unifying kind of feel of finding that lit up thread in all of it. And so make sure you're going over into his space, particularly if you're drawn into some of the religious traditions and you're trying to make sense of how they all kind of fit together, how how you can fit all of the different traditions that you've got going on inside of you into some semblance of, of a way to make sense of it. His space does a great job of that. Um, we will be right back after the break, folks, because today Rabbi Rami Shapir is here sharing the walk of the Lamed Bavnik. We will be right back after the break. Awesome, folks. We're back. You're listening to the Science of Superpowers. And again, we've got Rabbi Rami Shapiro here talking all about the walk of the Lamed Vavnik. And we got into it before and it, I mean, there's such a richness there. And I found myself getting lost in, in the story because it's so beautiful. And, and I love that you brought forward this concept of choice and that's where we left it off, right? In the, in the traditions, right? It, it is this idea of this, this you're selected, right? You, you're chosen, you're the chosen one. And I know a big part of the conversation in consciousness, new age kind of personal development, all of the high vibe spaces of transition that we're in the midst of, that some of that conversation is how do you sort of um, catalyze that for yourself, right? Like, like let's say I haven't been chosen, like no angel appeared, like it wasn't like, oh, you know, you're, you're this thing, but, but we can feel the resonance with it, right? And, and so I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about that delicate dance of like the responsibility of the avatar, right? The form and the conditioning and the programs and also this real surrender into the the feel right this co-creative element that guides all of us how, how do you how do you reconcile that or what can you speak into that well my sense of it is that everyone everything is, is a manifesting of the divine however you want to language that so i don't i don't talk about chosen and not chosen i think everyone is a manifesting of god whether you're working with that energy or not that's different question but there's nothing you lack it's not like god looks down and says oh i'm going to give this person the extra boost but not that person i'm going to mm -hmm. let that person wallow in darkness 
that's not how it works. I, first of all, I don't believe God is conscious. God mm -hmm. isn't going, oh, I like this. I don't like that. God is reality. God is everything. And including us, it's consciousness. So uh, you have it. There's nothing you're missing, but you may not, you know, you may be blocking yourself in some way. But even that, I mean, this is this is the the radical gift of grace is even if you say to yourself, oh, no, that can't be true. I'm not worthy. Even the thought that you're not worthy is part of the divine manifesting. You can't escape the infinite divine reality because it's infinite. There's no place mm. that it isn't, even in your own denial that you're worthy. So even if you go, oh, that can't be right. I can't be part of the divine. Even that thought is part of the divine. So there's nowhere to go. There's nothing you need. There's nothing you lack. All you have to do is wake up. But some people aren't ready. And that's part of the divine also. So you're not ready. If you beat yourself over the head with that, that's just egotistic, narcissistic, you know, it's, it's like saying, oh, you're all ready, but I'm not ready. It's, it's, it's reverse. I'm so special that I'm not ready. Yeah. You know? It's like <laughs> Those oh, tricky egos, man, they got it all. Don't yeah. They? It's like, oh, you're so holy, but I'm so special that I'm not holy. <laughs> I mean, it's all just silliness, <laughs> but we do that. That's just how, how, you know, some of us play that way, but it, it's, it's really silly. Mm -hmm. it's, it, all of us are offered this infinite gift of awareness, compassion, and, and not just compassion for ourselves, but this infinite gift of compassion through us for everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Lama Dvavnik is in love with everybody, with everything, and engages with mm -hmm. everything uh, from that love. But it's not that they... Um, they cultivated it consciously. They, you know, they weren't, and then they became, you know, these loving beings. It's that they received this gift and they were transformed and they realized, oh, I always had this, but I didn't know it. I didn't know it. Yeah. So uh, it, it's this, this process of awakening. I mean, no matter what you say about it, because we're using language, it misrepresents it. Because even if I say process, it sounds like, oh, it's over time. It's it's just now. It's happening now. Right. But we don't accept it. So um, so there really isn't any work to be done except the work to stop working at it and allowing what is to simply flourish. Hmm. Uh, that's what makes it so hard is the fact that it's so easy. But we don't like it easy. We think, oh, this has got to be a struggle. And all of our religions tell us this is hard work yeah. or you know, and, and it's expensive. You have to take so many courses and go to so many mm -hmm. seminars and spend so much time and money because you can't, you know, if, if I come to you and I say, oh, look, you already have everything you need. Just wake up. I can't then charge you $5,000 for that advice. It nope. doesn't work. No. Nope. So I have to really spend a lot of time telling you, you really can't do this without me. Pay me $5,000. And then I say, and you've already got it, <laughs> then maybe you'll go, oh, that was $5,000 well spent. So it's, it's all very tricky, but God doesn't care about our finances this way. So it's just about waking up to the abundance that's always present in you, with you, as you, um, and then acting accordingly. And, and I'm talking about spiritual abundance because there's real injustice in the world. There's real scarcity in the world that we've created by denying the true abundance that everybody has um, by blocking it in ourselves and then blocking it in other people. So I'm not, I don't want to make light of real suffering, but that real suffering is caused by people, not by right. God. Yeah, that's a good deduction. And, and I, it reminds me as you were speaking to this notion of, you know, part of the disbelief is part of the, the journey. And it reminds me of the scene from the matrix where he's standing in the kitchen with the Oracle. And she's like, well, you know what I'm going to tell you next? He's like, yeah, that I'm not the one. And, and she's like, yep, sorry guy. But it's, it, it's such a great reminder of our belief makes it so, and it's a trip. Like a big part of this is like, oh, wait, you were talking to me too. Like, oh, like me too, like really me, or just like sort of me or me after I die or like, 
me if I were to do all these things or me if I was to this. And what we discovered is stewards, because I know a lot of you really are challenged with how do you develop things to support people in this walk when exactly what Rami just said is true. And, and so there is this beautiful walk of what are we exposing ourselves to? You know, a big part of the network when we started in 2016 was to broadcast out exactly this type of information because what we found was the clients we were working with were having a lot of difficulty managing to maintain that state of awareness in their current environments. It wasn't that they were lacking. It was that the environments that they were in were conditioned in certain ways. And it was so antithetical to this waking up process that it was challenging. And so what the attuning, right? What are you surrounding yourself? What are you allowing to program yourself? That's huge, folks. We know programming works. It's called programming. They are programs for a reason. They program us just, and it's not good, bad, or otherwise. You're just being programmed. And if you don't particularly like what that program results in, choose a different program, right? Expose yourself, consume things that are in support of where it is that you want to go, right? It's making that switch from I am where I am because these things happen to me or these things happen to me. And, and so this is, this is, this is where I am and it, into, I'm, I'm choosing to be this way so that these things can happen, right? Otherwise we're kind of stuck in this perpetual loop. And so there are things you can do to say, you know what? I'm not enjoying the experiences that I'm having. I'm not enjoying the results of what my efforts are creating. And, and, and what I would recommend in that situation, if you really do want to kind of get on your journey or feel like you're moving in that direction, is, is do that. Identify as somebody who is in the process of that so that you're reminded in every moment that there's a bigger conversation happening. That can do wonders to opening you up. Creation's going to teach you. God's going to teach you. The field's going to teach you all in your way. It's all very personalized. It's all very unique. It's all your words and your way, your timing. And it's beautiful. That is grace. That is that is the definition of grace, to be able to learn and grow um, in a loving relationship and a loving container within yourself. And there are things that you can do, like participating in, in what Rami's offering in their spaces, just exposing yourself to these ideas, listening to podcasts that say, hey, like, I think we can do better. Like, I think we are bigger than this. I think we're more than what we think we are. Um, and be real cautious about what you're taking in as truth for yourself. Rami, what advice can you offer um, as folks are looking out at that world of like, doesn't match up with this beautiful reality that we're painting? What can you offer in that, that sort of chasm there? Well, I would say two things, just riffing off of what you were saying. I had a teacher who said, you know, I was talking to him and I said, just what you were saying a moment ago, you know, sometimes I'm in touch with this greater reality and sometimes I'm not. And he said, well, when you're not, how do you know you're not? The only reason you know you're not is because you know what it's like to be in touch. So when you're not, you're really still in touch. It's all part of the same greater thing. So don't make that distinction. It's just okay, I'm one way, I'm another way, but it's all part of the greater whole. You can't escape the greater whole. But more importantly, you said a moment ago, you know, we're more than what we think we are or who we think we are. We're completely not who we think we are. You know, I get up in the morning and I think I'm, I identify as Rami and I put on the mindset of a Jewish guy and he's white and he's male and he's 72 years old, and he's got all, you know, he's a grandfather, he's got, you know, all the stuff that, that defines me. And um, I, I do this exercise with people. Sometimes we stand in front of full length mirrors with um, the sticky notes, and I have you write down all the things that defined you, and you put them on your reflection on the mirror. So I put Rami, Jewish, white, blah, 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 all these things, till the mirror is all covered. And then I say, now step away from the mirror. You know, you leave all the notes on the mirror, but step away. When you're not looking at your reflection and all those labels, now who are you? And so who you really are, who I really am, and who all of us really is, when you're free from all the labels, who are you? Mm, well, beautiful. you can't say exactly because mm -hmm. there's no words at that point. But beautiful. I would say, if I'm forced to put words on it, that who you are is the same as who I am when we're free from all those labels. And it, I would say it's the divine, it's the field. There's just this one di infinite dynamic happening 
happening in an infinite array of unique ways, but not separate, just unique. So Tanya is, is a happening of this field and I'm a happening of the field. And when you look at the specific happenings, they're unique and different and precious, but never separate. But when she and I can step out of the unique, you know, when she can step out of the, the Tonya and I can step out of the Rami, it's just the happening itself. That's right. You're really the happening. The happening's never born. The happening never dies. And I mean, I've been, I've been uh, sick lately. I've had, I don't know what the issues are, but I've been in the hospital. Mm. And, you know, if I can slip out of Rami's in the hospital mode and I do it through chanting primarily. But if I can put my body in the chanting modality and slip from Rami to this happening consciousness, uh, I'm I'm not sick. Yeah. I'm I don't I'm just the infinite. Mm -hmm. um, I mean I have to deal with the fact that my body is ill, but I'm not that consciousness isn't ill. Yeah. You're that not identifying with it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. because it's not me. I mean, I'm this, you know, the Rami that's sick in the hospital is this big, but the universal field is immense. That's right. So that's right. If, if I can be aware of the greater me of which Rami is a part, I can, I don't, I don't want to say I can breeze through things because that's not true. And I don't think that's even wise, but I'm not trapped in the, in the little me. Um, so I mean, that's maybe the ultimate superpower is to is to really tap into the greater reality of which sure. you are a part. You're a wave of this infinite ocean. The wave is temporary. The ocean is permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are lots identify? of waves. <laughs> yeah, and they're all cool. And that's some right. of them are stormy and some of them are calm or whatever. But there's no good wave or bad wave. Mm -hmm. But there's only one ocean. And when that wave, when the wave that I call Rami is finished, uh, anyone who loved that wave will grieve. And the, but the, and the extent to which I identify as that wave and I see I'm coming to the end of my run, I'm going to be upset. But that's stupid because I've forgotten on the ocean hmm. and the ocean just keeps rolling on. So the, the, the ultimate awareness is to realize you're uh, the ocean as well as the wave, but mostly the ocean. Beautiful, beautiful. I love that. Do you know, we were teaching social identity theory to counterintelligence agents, my husband and I. We would hold up, we had a hula hoop exercise and stuff that, that I gleaned through uh, my time in academia. And so I love that you brought that up of, of who are we, right? How do we identify? Like it, in every field, folks, this isn't religion. This isn't spirituality. Seriously, we were teaching it in, in military, government, counterintel, corporate, academia everybody is asking these questions. I don't know anybody after the pandemic who's not going, uh, what? <laughs> like, what just happened, right? Yeah. And so we're all dealing with this now in the sense of like some level of, of identity crisis, confusion, like existential whatnot, it's happening within so many people. Um, take this advice to heart, folks. You're not alone, first of all. Many people are kind of wondering what's going on? Who am I? Like big big questions, right? And if you want some guidance, right? If you want some, some support, make sure you're getting it from the places that feel good to you, right? Go check out Rami's work. Get over to superpowerexperts.com, folks. We all have tons of resources for you. Remember, remember, remember that you get to choose in those moments to remember how big you are, right? You are the entirety of it all. And we are full of contradictions and that's part of what makes us so incredible. And so Rami, thank you so much for being here, for being a celebrated man of co-creation, dedicating your existence to something beyond yourself. A, a grateful world thanks you. And on behalf of the Superpower Network, we thank you um, because we see what you're doing and you know, and we know you're making a difference. So thank you for your efforts. Well, thanks for having me on the show. And it was really a pleasure. Oh, so glad. And, and we're so glad that all of you continue to join us here. You can watch the Science of Superpowers now on YouTube and YouTube and Rumble. And of course, we're everywhere else, all the podcast places. Thank you for making the Superpower Network in the top 1.5% of podcasts globally. Folks, we are having these conversations. People are listening. We are ready. It is time, right? 
Go get yourself lit up some way, somehow. Go light up. Remember who you are. Go be of service, folks. That helps tremendously. We have been talking with Rabbi Rami Shapiro here all about the walk of the Lam and Vavnik. If that didn't inspire you folks, I don't know what will. Listen to it again, and I, I guarantee it will, all right? So Rami, take care. We love you all. Love you to out, out there in the communities. And until next time, love each other. Take care. <laughs>